Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney here, and I have the honor of having Mr. Jordan Montgomery on the podcast. How are you, sir? Austin, I'm well. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for taking the time. I'm good. You know, I, I followed your content for a while. I have a picture of who you do, wh- who you are and what you do, but it's nice to kind of finally meet you in, in person. What I like to do with my guests is I like them to start their story wherever they want to, and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, I grew up in small town, Iowa, uh, Kelowna, Iowa, to be exact, the largest Amish community west of the Mississippi, Austin. So I had a great childhood, middle class family. Dad was a blue collar business owner. Mom was a teacher. I went to the University of Iowa um, sort of as a social experiment. I thought, you know what, I'm going to go meet some people, have some great experience, but I just want to be an entrepreneur like my dad. And my dad ran a pretty simple business, a little painting business. So he was a blue collar, kind of a construction guy. But I always really valued the fact that my dad could be at all of my activities, all of my games. He was just an omnipresent father and um, really, really respected that, valued that. So from a young age, I knew I wanted to control my, my time and sort of create my own schedule. So I wanted to be a business owner. But I went to college, Austin, and I realized there was two things that created an issue for me. Number one, I had no money when I graduated college. I was actually just in a bunch of debt. And number two, I had no experience. So um, I joined a company in the financial services industry where I could be in business for myself, but not by myself. So I had the support of a bunch of people, mentors, counsel, systems, processes, didn't have to invest any money, had a, a quick rise in that sort of business working with clients and then eventually taking over an office, had a big fall from grace at 27 years old. It completely changed my life. Uh, we might get into that. Uh, but that fall from grace is what gave birth to so many important and meaningful things in my life today. Uh, my relationship with my wife, our children, our business. And uh, it's been said that sometimes your deepest hurt creates your greatest ministry. And that's our story. So I've just given my life to uh, leading, serving, and coaching people. We have a full-scale coaching and consulting company, Montgomery Companies, uh, 15 coaching partners. My wife and I run the business together. Um, The big joke is I kind of run my mouth and she runs the business. So I do a fair bit of keynote speaking at larger corporate events. And then our coaching consulting work is primarily focused with um, athletes, salespeople, and executive leaders. So um, we live in Iowa City, Iowa, three young children. Um, and, uh, life is, life is good most days. So, um, that's kind of the story, Austin. So what allowed you, uh, is your, your, your kind of fall from grace at 27, what allowed you to take that and, and push it towards motivation and create what you've created from it? And then on the back of that, what, why do people not do that more often? Like what is, what is holding them back from taking that kind of step down to that fall from grace that you've seen over time? Cause you, you used it to create something special, right? And, and others kind of just live inside of it for, for years on end. Yeah. Well, isn't it interesting that, um, you know, there's that old quote that adversity builds character. Everybody says that, right? Like adversity builds character and, and you know, that's the path forward. And I actually don't believe that's true. Um, <laughs> I know a lot of people that have hit adversity that have not, progressed or have not moved forward, you know, they're still dealing with major issues. That's not to say that they can't still move forward, but they haven't yet. So I believe adversity builds character if you allow it to. And it's still a conscious choice when you fall down, when you make a mistake, when challenge sets in, it's still a conscious choice to ask yourself the question, well, part of the problem is me. Uh, what can I do to improve? Or if it really wasn't your fault, maybe it's something that kind of came upon you and it really wasn't any of your own doing. You still have a, a question to ask, which is what can I learn? How can I use this to serve others? Uh, it's not about me, but it starts with me. So I think it really is a mindset it starts in the mind, Austin, when you face adversity to say, okay, 
how can I, how can I use this for good? And, um, I don't think God caused my event, but I think he allowed it to happen. And I'm fortunate that it happened. So many times you go through the valley and we don't realize that it's where all the good things happen. So uh, the valley for me is where I learned about self-awareness. Uh, it's where I learned about stewardship, leadership. It's where I learned about who I was. It's where I understood faith in a deeper way. Really where a lot of my deepest and most meaningful relationships were forged. So. Um, what prevents people, I think, is the inability to ask one simple question, which is what part of the problem is me or what can I learn if it's a situation you're dealing with that maybe was just sort of forced upon you and wasn't, uh, you know, any any fault of your own? Because we do go through those things, too, right, where it's a sickness, an illness, somebody forsakes you or leaves you. Um, so I, I want to be mindful of that, too. But but for me, it was answering the question, what part of the problem is me that really set me free and allowed me to move forward and grow. So what part of the problem was you? Yeah, I was a 27-year-old, um, ego-driven, self-absorbed young man. I mean, I, I really was controlled by the ways of the world, and I didn't know that about myself. I mean, it's kind of like um, people who are really annoying. Uh, they don't know they're annoying, which is what makes them annoying. Um, I didn't know that I was being controlled that way by, you know, accomplishment, achievement, my bank account, my status, but, but it very much defined how I saw myself. It defined how I saw others, how I viewed the world. And very quickly, my, my sort of goals preceded my values. You know, Aeneas Williams said this years ago, he said, if you Set your goals before you understand your values. Your goals can take you to a place that you never intended to go. And that was sort of my story. I just, I was moving really fast. Um, I was pursuing things that won't last and really don't matter. And in light of pursuing those things and moving really fast, there was a, a staff member of mine who took a test on my behalf. Um, I didn't report it like I should have when I found out about it. And it was grounds for termination. And all those things, um, although those things happen, they shouldn't happen. It was still an infraction. Um, I spent the better part of several months making all kinds of excuses and pointing the finger. Um, that infraction ultimately led to me being temporarily let go. And they moved my book of business to somebody else, which cost me millions of dollars in future revenue. And I was also involved in some real estate deals that went sideways. So I'll save our listeners the full story, Austin, but I went from sort of the proverbial penthouse to the outhouse almost overnight. Uh, my ordeal was very public. And although it wasn't malicious or intentional, it was careless and it was a bit casual. And um, when you're casual, you create casualties. So at a young age, I needed to learn about stewardship, leadership, responsibility. Um, but more than anything, I needed to get rid of my pride and ego and that's still there today, right? I'm not like, uh, I haven't arrived. Um, but in a very real way, God dealt with me through a set of circumstances that forced me to sort of slow down um, and deal with some of those some of those issues. Yeah, the, the comment I say, uh, you know, much about my thing, but the universe is undefeated. <laughs> It gets yeah, you every time. Yeah. And as you get older, the lessons get more expensive and they, and they hurt more and they're more public, you know, and yeah. I, and I, you know, I've been sober for four and a half years, but was a drug addict and homeless and, and was an alcoholic for 20 years, been sober, lost 80 pounds, you know, all the things, right. Wow. Good for you. Thank you. And it wasn't until I read Jocko's book, you know, extreme ownership that I realized that for my entire life, I blamed everybody else in the world around me. Yeah. And, and it seems like the same thing kind of happened to you. You took, you had to eventually take complete ownership of your mess. And then the, the secret thing that nobody talks about is the moment that you did, it was released from you. Yeah. Come on. It's good. Yep. Yeah. Brene Brown says it this way. When you deny the story, it defines you. And when you own the story, you can write a brand new ending. Mm. And I think for so many people, they're sort of trapped in their past, you know, and we always remind people that, that, that God doesn't want to deal with you in your past. He wants to deal with you in your future and in your present, you know, because um, we all have a past. And if you're focused on the past, you live in regret and fear and depression. And I didn't want to live that way. But, but I think as long as we point the finger, as long as we're looking outward, 
we will be trapped in mm-hmm. some form or fashion in our past. Mm-hmm. So that was for me, I just needed to get beyond that. I needed to take ownership. I needed to ask myself some really deep and hard questions. And when I did that, it set me free and allowed me to move forward. And, and dude, congratulations to you for doing the same thing. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful, wonderful story, you know, just overcoming yeah. adversity. I, and two yeah, weeks, two, awesome. two week, yeah, two weeks ago, I just spoke on stage for the first time at a prison. Wow. And, uh, wow. Sev- 70 guys staring at you in the face with teardrop eye tattoos and, and you're thinking, Oh, this isn't a business seminar. Uh, and then you, wow. what I said to the, to the, the crowd the next day, was understand that all those, and, and I mean this wholeheartedly, all those prisoners are more honest with themselves than most of the American public. Because yep. they've, had, they've had to stare in the abyss. They don't have the distraction. They've had to deal with their demons staring at a wall. Yeah, man, it's so true. And so you have an opportunity to own your truths and just, it's a long life. <clears throat> but if we, we act like it's this little microcosm of this little bitty thing, right? And that's not the case, right? And and so, you know, what I used to do, and I don't do it anymore, but it was it was, part, it was kind of comical. Uh, I would go to a business meeting, or, or whatever you want to call it, right? And I would be like, "Hey, I'm uh, I'm Austin Lenny. Uh, I was a meth addict. I'm homeless. I was an alcoholic, and I'm divorced." And like they would go, "Whoa, oh my god!" But like what I'm doing is basically giving them the freedom to tell their story too. Because yeah. the moment that they yeah. see me on mine is that's why I started the podcast. Yeah. Like good. everybody has a story, right? Well, it's that whole, it's that whole thing about vulnerability begets vulnerability, you know? Mm-hmm. So when we're vulnerable with others, it allows people to be vulnerable with us. And it's interesting, Austin, we spent a lot of time on the art of communication with leaders, you know, in business and sports and life. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things that we've identified is there's this, there's this human connection gap. Right. Because we're really all in the connection business. I mean, whether you run a podcast, you work in real estate, finance, you're a doctor, you're, I mean, at the end of the day, we're all dealing with other people. We're dealing with humans. We're connecting on some level and in some way, day in and day out. So if we're in the connection business, it's important for us to understand connection. And to understand connection is to deal with the gap in connection, which is this vulnerability is the first thing I look for in you. And it's the last thing I want you to see in me. And that creates a gap. So when we start connecting, we start talking. The first thing I'm testing for subconsciously, we don't even know that we're doing this. We're usually not consciously aware of it. I'm testing for Austin's authenticity Uh, or whoever it is that that person I'm talking to. Are they real? Can I trust them? You know, am I getting the real Austin? And when you're vulnerable, when you're willing to say, man, this is me, this is who I am. It's part of my story. I'm not perfect. Whether you share a part of your story or sometimes it's just in the way that you conduct yourself or carry yourself, right? That being able to, to see some, the, the real Austin allows me to be free with you. Mm-hmm. Vulnerability begets vulnerability. Craig Rochelle says it this way. Um, we can be impressed with somebody's strengths, but we actually connect to them through their weakness. Mm-hmm. And that's why when we hear somebody's story, maybe there's a, a, a vulnerable story that somebody shares from a stage like you did at the prison, right? And imagine those, those prisoners are going, man, I like this guy. Like, he's like me. He gets me. He's my kind of guy, right? Because mm-hmm. you were real with them. So vulnerability is a tool, but it's also a choice. And uh, I commend you on sharing your story and and coming forward with, you know, your past and, and using it to help other people. Are you, uh, are you, are you familiar with George Bernard Shaw? I am. Yeah. Okay. So my favorite quote in the entire world, because I run like seven or I run eight companies and I've, all I do is study leadership. The single greatest problem, problem with communication, communication is the illusion that it's taken it's place. place. Yeah. And so what we as leaders of a company, we're moving so quickly and there's so many things in the level playing field that we're dealing, sales, marketing, people, emotions. Uh, my, my, I need this for my kid that, you know, you're, there's so many things that we're moving yeah. so quickly that we've asked what I've asked my companies to do. And I, we just had a meeting about this yesterday is I would rather you over communicate with me and then me to throttle it back than the other way around. Yeah. Like yeah. let's get in the habit of over communicating. Then I'll filter out and tell you, okay, we don't need this much. 
but the illusion that the communication has taken place is actually what creates really bad decisions in business and gets people sued by not having the full scope yeah. of information, you know? Almost every, wouldn't you say Austin, almost every issue in business in dealing with others, it's either a lack of communication or miscommunication. 100%. At, at, at its core, right? At the root of whatever that issue is, there's either a miscommunication or a lack of communication. Because, because nine times out of 10, what we decided in our companies is one thing. It's very simple. We protect the decisions. Mm. We're protecting the energy of the decision. So if you're not showing up healthy, you're not investing in yourself, you're not taking your time for yourself in the morning, you're going to make an improper emotional decision, which is bad for the overall company. So it's all about blocking and tackling to make sure that the decision makers, the CEOs, the, the, the business people have the opportunity to make a decision in clear mind with proper food in their system and, and safety and secure decision. It's good. That's good. I love that. Love that. It's beautiful. Yeah. And it's important. And, and I think part of that is it gets back to over communicating, over communicating your values, over communicating the why, over communicating what you're asking people to do and what you expect. Um, Andy Stanley says it this way. He says, uh, the cost of under communicating will always be greater than the cost of over communicating, right? Because a lack of communication is eventually translated as a lack of mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. So in our organization, same thing. And we're often talking about that with leaders, you know, being a CRO, a chief reminding officer, staying on topic. People want to be reminded more than they need to be instructed. They don't always need something fresh and new. They need the truth. They need the why. They need the values. Um, they need Austin to step in and say, hey, this is who we are. This is what we do. I know I've told you seven times, but I'm going to tell you eight. Um, so <laughs> it's that it's that whole over communication thing that is so essential to growth and progress that we so often forget. So I love that. That's part of your DNA and that's part of what you're helping others with, man. So important. So when you're coaching from a point of view, because I know y'all handle some companies, which is what we're, you know, we handle companies, but you, I think you're doing it at a much larger scale and something we're trying to move into. One of my specialties, and I, I would imagine is the same with you, is that um, I, I'm a really good at spotting talent, like the true intention of somebody and what they're capable of. They might not even know what they're capable of. One of my favorite uh people in the entire world is a doctor, a friend of mine who said that, you know, I didn't love myself enough to change, but I borrowed the belief in others long enough to change for myself. Ooh, good. And, good. and when I got sober and I got divorced, like that was the same thing. There was mentors above me, millionaire people, guys that I respected had great relationships with their family that saw say, Hey kid, I don't know what it is, man, but you just keep rolling. Right. And so when you're out there and you're, you're leading your people, like, what, what would you, is there a common theme between them that, that makes them more successful than not, or, or more locked in than not? Like you see, like running across the thing of like stories they tell themselves or limiting beliefs. Like what's, what are you doing as a CEO of your company nine times out of 10 with them to get them to kind of step into their greatness and live their, their, their truths? Like, is it like a system yeah. or a playbook that y'all have? Well, I think there's a couple themes um, for identifying talent helping people step into their, their God-given giftedness, realize their potential. I think one is, you know, the art of encouragement. Um, there's this big question that we often ask, and it's how do you know if somebody needs encouragement? And the answer to that question is they, they have a pulse. That's how you know. So everybody needs it. People want to be known. They want to be seen. Oh my God. Uh, it's just the truth. Right. And like, for whatever reason, we forget that. Like we walk around as if people don't need that or they already know that they're great or good. At I them. would venture to guess it's the only thing they need. Yeah, it is. It's, it's offering hope and depositing belief and transferring energy. It's pulling people aside to say, Hey, Austin, I see something in you. I want to remind you of this. I know I've told you this before, but I'm going to tell you again, uh, you're gifted, you're talented in these ways. This is what makes you unique, special, and impactful to our organization and to the people around you in general. And, um, you know, there's this interesting uh, study, Harvard Business Review conducted some research. They interviewed um, 4,000 recent college graduates, all of whom had quit their job within 12 months of graduating from college. So you got 4,000 recent college graduates. They all have one thing in common. They quit, you know, whatever their first job was right out of college. So they interviewed these students and they asked them, um, you know, why did you, why'd you quit? You were just a student, you graduated college. Why'd you walk away from that, 
that first job? Was it lack of autonomy, lack of pay, lack of culture, lack of leadership? What was it? Um, 79% of the 4,000 students surveyed said that a lack of appreciation mm. was the number one reason. So they walked away because they did not feel encouraged, cared for, seen, noticed, and appreciated. So when it gets back to helping others grow, evolve, and step into their God-given giftedness, I think it starts with somebody saying, hey, I see something in you. You matter. I notice. You know, People will go farther than they think they can when somebody else thinks they can. Point and simple. I, uh, I run into it from time to time. There's a couple guys that we consult with that are, you know, the older, older guard. And I just look them dead in the face and I go, guys, this, this way that you think that these people will lead by, by shaming and micromanaging and, and yelling at, it don't work. It's so outdated and it's not going to get you to where you go. My team is empowered. They're, they're allowed to make mistakes. They're supported. Yeah. You know, I would imagine that you take the same tack and that's why y'all had so much success and grown as big as you have, because, you know, what really did it for me was when I, I worked in the service industry hotel, I was a master bartender, sold wine for years, but the last company I was with, the guy was a billionaire. He was worth like, you know, 5 billion. They sold their company to Campbell soup. And like he created this amazing thing down in San Antonio and real estate company. And I looked at him and I waited on him all the time. Like he, we, I always saw him and, and talked to him and he wore a cowboy hat and, and jeans. And I really looked at him and I said, okay, so everybody I've come in contact with to my boss, to the CEO of the company is amazing human beings. Like stop, doesn't matter who they are. They stop and say, Hey, are you okay? Is it, are, how's your doing? Anything we can do to support you. And I looked at that and I go, Oh, it's really about what it comes from, from the top. Mm. And the people that aren't falling in line with that, and we had lots of employees, hundred plus. It didn't matter. You got weeded out real quick. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that happens in your companies the same way too. If you're not, if the standard of value driven personality and, and growth mindset and, and human connection is not met, I'm sure they're, if they happen to get, get got in, they, they leave real quick. Yeah, man. I mean, more, more is caught than taught, you know? And so I think it's incumbent upon a leader to model those values and to be curious and to ask questions and to encourage others and to empower people. And so, so I, I love that story, man, that um, it, it does start at the top. And I, I think to this end of encouragement, Austin, one thing that I'd also say is um, times have changed. And I think, you know, maybe like for our parents' generation, you think about like the baby boomers or even Gen Xers, there was almost this um, mantra of like, do it anyway, right? Like, hey, I know you don't like work, but you put your work boots on and you go to work and you don't complain and you like, there's like, there's like pride in that, right? Um, Cause that's kind of how they grew up. Like my grandpa was a fourth generation farmer and my uncle took over that. And that's just how those guys operate, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you like the work, you're gonna put in the work, you're gonna put in the time and you're gonna honor your family and provide. And then you have like, Gen Zers and millennials who grew up in a participation trophy era, um, very different in terms of options. Communication was different. Uh, instant gratification was much more, uh, much more uh, obvious, you know, in, in our upbringing. And so we have shorter attention spans. Um, again, there are more options. We want to be coddled. You know, Jason Dorsey says it this way, like our, uh, our parents would have got called to the principal's office and they got, you know, they got the paddle. And um, in today's world, a Gen Zer gets called to the principal's office and they call the attorney, right? And they're like, mom, you know, mom, attorney, I'm going in. Like, so it's just, it's a, it's a different, it's a different generation. The point is these Gen Zers, these young people, they want to be cared for and appreciated in a different way. And whether you like it or not, it's true. And here's one just practical application I'll give to our listeners, because I think this is important. It's not that people aren't encouraging their team. It's that sometimes I think they're doing it the wrong way. And they tend to prioritize the do over the who. And I think that's a mistake. So it's, hey, great sale, great, great week, great month. Love that presentation. You killed it. You had an awesome year. You know, Austin, I so much appreciate all that you're doing. Keep killing it. Keep crushing it. Okay, well, that's fine. 
but that doesn't mean as much as when you speak to who somebody is. So we want to prioritize the who over the do. So I could say to you, I could pull you aside and say, Austin, man, I love your curious spirit. And that's part of who you are. You're curious. You ask great questions. You're engaging. You're intentional. Man, that's part of who you were made to be. That makes you unique. I want you to see that in yourself and know that that part of who you are provides tremendous value to our organization. So keep showing up that way because you're making, you're making a difference. So just because I'm transparent with my audience, by you saying that to me, there was a feeling that welled up inside me of energy and it makes me want to run through a brick wall. So I'm trying to say like, if you were that intentional as a boss or a leader, like it would, it would show up like in, it would directly into your. Yeah. It, 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 it makes a difference. And like, here's a, cause here's the thing, Austin, if somebody has a really big month or a big week or they kill that presentation, well, Everybody knows that it's super obvious. And they probably got complimented 10 other times for the same thing. Mm -hmm. But very few people have probably pulled that same individual aside to point out their gifts. You know, the things that, 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 that part of their character, it's in their DNA. It's part of who they are. If, if we think back, all of us, so if somebody's listening to this right now, I want you to think back to your, um, like the two or three most powerful impactful conversations you had in your whole life, like positive, uplifting, encouraging. Mm -hmm. And it's almost a guarantee that it had more to do with who you are mm -hmm. and for far less to do with something that you did. And maybe it was something that you did that led to the encouraging conversation about who you are. But at the end of the day, people want to be encouraged for who they are, not what they do. And I think that's a, that's a reminder to leaders, myself included. Like we, we need to remember that and how we engage and encourage others. I remember the conversation with the mentor. It. Tell me about it. Oh man. So uh, I didn't know him that well, but he's extremely successful, great dude. And uh, basically for five months, I was trying to spend the day with him. Uh, I lived in Texas, he lived in Arizona. And he kept like saying, I can't, I'm too busy. And then finally on the sixth month, I bought a plane ticket and I said, figure it out. I'll be there at 5 a.m. at your gym. And so I flew in and I spent the day with him. And um, I knew from his Instagram that he loved old Cadillacs. So I rented a 66 Cadillac DeVille to drive around for the day to let him drive. And he said, why did you do this? Because he was like beyond happy. And I said, because when I leave here today, you're going to know that Austin Lenny was here. That's and, cool. you That's know, because awesome. people, people ask him all the time. Right. So I spent the whole day with him. We walked 12 of his flips, but like literally all day, I'm telling him all these ideas. This is me like way younger and like super excited. And, uh, we were driving in the car and he said, you know, what'd be awesome. He said, I've sat here and I've listened to every fucking thing that you talked about. Pardon my French. He said, you've said this idea, you've done that, but you know, what'd be even better. It'd be amazing if I didn't hear about what you were going to do. And in six months, I looked up and you just did it. And he goes, stop asking for permission. And then we wow. went in and then we went into the restaurant and it was like, I was still married at the time. I wasn't happy in my marriage. And he was like, look, you got a lot of energy, but you're not going anywhere. He goes, what do you really want? Like, do you, is this what you really want? Cause I don't believe it's what you really want. You're mm -hmm. in debt. You're in a marriage that doesn't serve you. You're buying real estate that you don't want to buy. That's not your business. You're, you're in the business of people. Mm. Stop selling yourself. And I mean, I literally cried for like an hour, but it was one of those conversations that somebody loved me enough to have the real, and it, this happened twice. There's two conversations like this with a friend who I randomly met at a coffee shop and was supposed to be there for five minutes. And I was there for three and a half hours crying wow. my eyes. This is when I was still drinking, crying my eyes out. And she's like, you're so talented but she did this. This is what she said. And this is still imprinted on my soul for the rest of my life. She said, there is no chance that you won't be successful. There's no chance. She goes, you'll create whatever you want to create. But are you going to be a, a bloody knuckle climber? Mm. Are you going to destroy every little relationship in your life when you're on top of the mountaintop? Who's going to be standing next to you? Because mm. at the way that you're going right now is nobody. Mm. Mm. It's powerful. And so that was the single greatest conversation. And I said, you understand that, that prison that I talked about, that? those men that I affected that cried in my arms, you have a hand in that. Yeah. 
And, you know, it's the truth. And those conversations, those truthful conversations that people have with you um, is out of love. It's not out of, it's not out of some and trying to get somewhere. And so when you find those people that are willing to love you and, and pour into you and, and create space for you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta listen. You gotta let your ego step aside and say, so maybe, maybe there's something there, right? Come on, man. Yep. It's the truth. Yeah. We all remember those conversations, right? Like they're just imprinted, as you said, imprinted on your soul forever and always. So I love it. Yeah. Thanks. So, for, thanks for sharing. You got it. So if people want to find out more about you, they want to, they want to, they want to follow your journey. They want to hear about the companies. How would they do that? Yeah. Montgomerycompanies.com is our website, Austin. So you could go to Montgomerycompanies.com. Fairly active on Instagram, Facebook, um, all social media channels. We'd love to engage with listeners. So if you have a question, um, you want to get in touch, send me a DM on a on a social media platform, uh, LinkedIn message, Instagram message. Would love to be helpful. Would love to be of service and of value. And uh, again, man, can't thank you enough for having uh, having me on the show. Appreciate what you stand for. Uh, you are one of the most engaging people that I've talked to in a long time on a podcast. So thanks for showing up with great questions and uh, really valued uh, the, the time that we spent together. So thank you. I appreciate you taking the time, guys. If you got some value from this episode, send it to a friend and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.